Hello, and welcome to the second part of the Civil Liberties Lecture. We're going to be talking about the Establishment Clause, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and several other things in the Bill of Rights. So let's start with the Establishment Clause. The First Amendment says, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Now, what does establishment mean? That becomes one of the central questions for the Supreme Court. Does establishment require coercion? In other words, would government taxing a certain religious view be coercive in trying to influence people to not adhere to that religion or to adhere to other religions? Would establishment be endorsement by government if, uh, for instance, a local government came out and said that uh, the official religion of the government is Christianity or particularly a denomination of Christianity? Would that represent an establishment? And what about religion over non-religion? Would simply promoting the idea that government endorses a view of God discriminate or be an establishment of religion over atheism or agnosticism? And even within a broad religious category, what about specific denominations? Is it okay for government, for instance, to benefit one denomination over another? So, Again, I think this highlights that ambiguity in the meaning of words in the Constitution opens a door for the Supreme Court to interpret their meaning and, and to rule about the limits and the boundaries of the Bill of Rights. So let's talk about standards. Remember that standards are simply uh, things used by the Supreme Court to balance the powers given to the federal government against the rights that individuals have. So regarding the Establishment Clause, one of the first efforts to establish a standard for determining what is and is not an establishment of religion was Lemon v. Kurtzman, a Supreme Court case that was decided in 1971. There are three parts, what we call the Lemon Test. A law has to pass all three of these tests in order to be considered constitutional. If the law fails any one of these parts of the test, then the law is deemed by the Supreme Court to be unconstitutional and is struck down or nullified. So the first part is that all laws have to have a secular legislative purpose. The purpose of the legislation cannot be to promote religion. It must be secular in nature. The second is that all laws have to have the primary effect of neither advancing nor inhibiting religion. And the third part, and the part that becomes the most controversial, is that laws cannot have a, quote, excessive government entanglement with religion. Now, hopefully you can see the, the first part is fairly straightforward and clear. The second part, also fairly clear. This last one, the reason it's controversial is that it is somewhat ambiguous, and the Supreme Court, uh, people have argued, have used the ambiguity of that language to create inconsistent rulings. Famously, Justice Antonin Scalia referred to the Lemon Test as a ghoul, and what he said is it's a test that the Supreme Court keeps in the closet and will pull out whenever they want to scare government away from religion. And the reality is that uh, the court has applied the standard inconsistently. It does not apply the standard to every case involving government and religious expressions. So in some cases, they've used other standards that have allowed religion in government. A famous case is that Congress, before every session, opens with a prayer. Now, the prayer sometimes changes from, from Christian to Muslim to Hindu to uh, Jewish prayers, and so that part of it allows different religious expressions, but it still favors religion over non-religion. And yet, the Supreme Court, even though the the law or the rule by Congress of having prayer to open each session of Congress clearly has no sec secular legislative purpose. The Supreme Court did not apply the Lemon Test to that practice. They used a different test, which was they basically said that the Congress has always opened with a prayer or some type of invocation, and therefore that the First Amendment cannot be interpreted to prohibit that when the Founding Fathers, having written the First Amendment, also engaged in this practice. So again, the point is that the Lemon Test is not used consistently, whether you know, some people argue that the Lemon Test is not appropriate for some types of cases. Scalia, for instance, uh, on the other hand, argued that it was just a way for the Supreme Court to pick and choose which cases it wanted to rule against or for. So 
Another effort, just to give you a, a sample of the Establishment Clause cases, another effort as standard involved the Board of Education versus Grummet. Now, this case involved a school district who drew boundaries around a community of Hasidic Jews in order to provide the uh, Jewish community with more control over their school district. The idea behind this was that integrating Hasidic Jews into the regular school system could create problems. And this was actually, the district boundary was not drawn to exclude them, it was actually drawn to empower them. The Supreme Court, in looking at this, created the neutrality standard. And this is a standard that's typically been used when you're dealing with public financing of religious activities. In this case, a school district gets public financing. And so in drawing the district boundaries based on religion, the school district was not created in a neutral manner towards religion. And therefore, the Supreme Court actually struck down the school district by arguing, again, that the school district boundaries were not drawn neutral to religion, that they were drawn to favor a particular religious group over others, and therefore that was unconstitutional. Now, we're not going to go through a lot of the different Establishment Clause cases. There are way too many of them. There are probably well over 100 cases about the Establishment Clause over the past 30 to 50 years. And so if you're interested in that, you can take a Civil Liberties class from the Department of Political Science where you will cover the broad range of these courses. The main point here, though, is that the Supreme Court has been consistent in one area, and that has to do with school prayer. They have consistently maintained the, quote, separation of church and state. What that means is that they are very skeptical of any case involving school prayer, probably because uh, they're afraid of undue influence on children in terms of their religious beliefs. In fact, most of the cases where the Supreme Court has struck down uh, practices of school prayer have involved some type of endorsement or coercion by the school. One example of this, one of the earliest cases, was uh, involved teachers in a classroom leading the students in prayer, a Protestant prayer actually, and reading passages from the Bible. Now, for students who were either not Christian or did not, you know, were not part of that particular Protestant message, they were asked to leave the room, stand outside in the hall while the prayer was said, and then they could come back in. The Supreme Court ruled that that was, uh, one, first, an endorsement of a particular religious view because public school teachers are public employees, schools get public funding, and therefore they acted as government endorsing a particular religious view. And second, that it was somewhat coercive to ask children who did not want to participate to leave the room. It isolated them and it uh, marginalized them by forcing them to wait outside in the hall while everybody else participated in this event. And they viewed that uh, they were afraid, the Supreme Court was afraid that that practice could unduly coerce or influence some students to stay and participate in a religious exercise that they did not believe in as a way to not be marginalized. Um, again, School prayer is somewhat of a controversial issue. Uh, this is just intended to introduce you to the argument or the logic behind the Supreme Court's reasoning. However, one thing that should be noted is that private prayer is still allowed in school, subject to the time, place, and manner, right? That's you know the context of when pr private prayer can, uh, can be expressed in the public schools. For instance, uh, children are not allowed to stand up in the middle of a math class and start praying aloud. That would be disruptive of the classroom. But the Supreme Court has said that children uh, at, in the lunchroom or during lunch are absolutely allowed to pray privately. They're allowed to engage in silent prayer or even group prayer as long as it's voluntary and not endorsed or led by the school, uh, by the school or the school employees. So again, private prayer is certainly allowed in private schools, or I'm sorry, in public schools, uh, but school prayer that is led or somehow endorsed by the school, the Supreme Court is very consistent in being very skeptical of that. That's the Establishment Clause. On the other side is the Free Exercise Clause. The First Amendment also says that government cannot infringe upon the free exercise of religion. Basically what it means is that people should be free, according to the Bill of Rights to worship without government intrusion. There are a lot of cases, notice that you know, these are not in red letters, you don't need to remember the specific cases, but one involved the practice of Jehovah's Witnesses who go around uh, and solicit money and also 
evangelize to people through neighborhoods. And a particular locality decided to ban that practice. What got the local government in trouble is that they targeted Jehovah's Witnesses specifically. They targeted a religious group instead of banning all solicitation. Even efforts at banning all solicitation, the Supreme Court has ruled is unduly um, restrictive of the Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs, where this solicitation is a very important part of their religious values and their religious practice. Another case involved the use of peyote by Native Americans. This was a case that was ruled in 1990. Native Americans, some Native American tribes, uh, as part of their religious ceremonies, uh, ingest or use peyote. Peyote, of course, is illegal at the federal level. The Supreme Court actually ruled that the federal law could stand, even though that law infringed upon the religious beliefs of certain Native American tribes, the law was allowed, was not ruled unconstitutional. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. And then another case in 1993 involved animal sacrifice, where a church, as part of its religious practices, uh, would sacrifice different animals, and a local community or local government actually banned the practice of animal sacrifice or the killing of animals for purposes that did not involve uh, consumption or eating of that animal. So... In this case, the Supreme Court uh, actually ruled that the law was unconstitutional and that the church should be allowed to engage in animal sacrifice. Again, like the Establishment Clause, there are a lot of different cases and a lot of different standards that the Supreme Court has created and cycled through over the years. Too many for us to cover in this short lecture, but I think we can make uh, some good sense out of all of these different cases with two basic principles, which is that the Supreme Court has said that government cannot ban explicitly religious acts such as soliciting money or animal sacrifice. That laws that target things that are explicitly religious are not allowed, and the Supreme Court will rule those laws unconstitutional. Government can, however, ban acts that are not explicitly religious. Drug use, for instance, and jesting or smoking peyote is not inherently religious, even though The law does infringe upon the rights of some religions. The law itself is not intended to target a religious practice and has a broader impact, which is to say nobody is allowed to smoke peyote regardless of their religious beliefs. And so the Supreme Court has consistently upheld laws that are not targeted at explicitly religious acts but at non-religious acts. So that, I think, is probably the best summary of the free exercise free exercise clause cases that have come through the Supreme Court. Let's turn and talk about freedom of the press. The Founding Fathers viewed freedom of the press as crucial for democracy. They viewed it as another check against political abuse. We talked about the system of checks and balances. The press has sometimes been called the fourth institution of Congress. You have the judicial branch, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the press is viewed as that fourth institution. So freedom of the press and the ability of the press to to, to report on things that government does is viewed as crucial for democratic governance because it is a way to inform the people of what the government's doing so that the people can hold the government accountable for those acts. Typically, the Supreme Court has not um, allowed a lot of limitations or regulations of the press by government, especially regulations that involve the restriction of things that the press or the media prints or broadcasts. The one area where the Supreme Court has allowed some restrictions on the press revolves, involves prior restraint. Prior restraint simply means that the government prohibits or prevents a written or recorded speech prior to it being published. So a newspaper wants to publish something, let's say, about the Iraq War, the government doesn't want them to publish it, so the government comes in and threatens to jail the reporters if, or the newspaper editor if it gets reported. That is prior restraint. It is restraining something from being published prior to it being published. The famous case here involves the New York Times and the Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon uh, Papers involves classified information that was given to the New York Times. The New York Times wanted to publish it. The government threatened to Uh, prosecute them for publishing that classified information. So in most cases, the Supreme Court, as in this case, prohibits prior restraint. They require that government 
uh, prosecute the media after it has published something and only if the content or the material that's published somehow is a violation of law. So again, the Supreme Court's very protective. They allowed the New York Times to publish the material. They ruled that the government was wrong in acting unconstitutionally by trying to engage in prior restraint over the Pentagon Papers. Um, what that means is that government has a huge burden in order to defend prior restraint. If the government wants to restrict a media outlet from publishing something, then they have to go to court and they have a very large burden to uh, justify that. Uh, that action. Otherwise, the Supreme Court will be very skeptical of the government's efforts and will typically allow the material to be published. The one area where the Supreme Court has been consistent in allowing prior restraint is anything that is a direct threat to national security, especially when troops are immediately threatened. For instance, if the New York Times wanted to publish uh, military plans, let's say during the Iraq War, and they wanted to have a map and show where the troops would be sent uh, in the lead up to the war. So let's say that they, they wanted to show a map and say that the U.S. troops are going to land or fly into this city on this day. Then the Supreme Court would probably allow the government to prohibit that uh, publication of the material because that would tip off the enemy to the military plans, and the enemy could then have their own troops there to meet the U.S. troops. So you can see how things that the media publishes that would be an immediate threat to military troops or to national security generally, uh, the Supreme Court would uphold that uh, and allow the government to engage in prior restraint for that. Another topic that we're going to talk about involves rights of the accused. The Bill of Rights contains several clauses in it relating to people who are accused of crime by the government. The basic idea behind these is they want to depoliticize the criminal process. They do not want the criminal justice sitting system being used to prosecute political enemies or to be used in a selective manner that um, would lead to corruption or undue influence by politicians. So in terms of the Bill of Rights, first of all, the Fourth Amendment prohibits illegal searches and seizures. In order to engage in a search or to see somebody's property, the government has to get a warrant and they have to justify the search or the seizure to a judge before they can go and do this. The famous case involving searches and seizures is MAP v. Ohio, MAP versus Ohio, and it created the exclusionary rule. What the Supreme Court said is that any evidence obtained by police during an illegal search has to be excluded during trial. So if the police bust into somebody's house without a warrant and engage in an illegal search of the house and they find drugs, the drugs and the evidence that they obtained from that illegal seat, uh, search cannot be used in trial against the defendant. So any of that evidence gets thrown, all of that evidence gets thrown out of court and the government cannot use that during the prosecution of the person. So again, just to summarize it, what it means is that evidence obtained via, uh, via uh, illegal search and seizure is excluded from trial and cannot be used to prosecute the individual. The Fifth Amendment protects individuals against self-incrimination. You do not have to incriminate yourself or give information to the government that would help them prosecute you. Now, hopefully this is one everybody's familiar with. The famous case is Miranda versus Arizona. And what it said basically is Supreme Court now requires police to read suspects a list of political rights prior to their arrest. There are some exceptions to the Miranda rule. This is not universal. Police do not always, in all circumstances, have to read people their Miranda rights. By the way, the Miranda rights are you have the right to remain silent. You, anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You've all seen cop shows, Law and Order, that kind of show. You hopefully are all familiar with that. If you're not, it's easy to find on the internet. Um, but the Miranda rule basically required that police notify people and tell people of their rights pri uh, as they're being arrested. And they have to notify people of these rights before they interrogate the person or before they ask them any questions. And because the exclusionary rule, any evidence they obtain, if they do not read people their Miranda rights and the person, for instance, confesses to a crime, that confession cannot be used in court because the person was not read their rights before they were being questioned by the police. 
Now, again, there are some exceptions to the Miranda rule. Um, we're not going to go into that, but just understand it's not absolute. There are some very limited cases where government does not have to read people their Miranda rights before they interrogate them. The Sixth Amendment includes several protections for people accused of crimes, including a speedy trial, an impartial jury, and a right to counsel. The one that we're going to talk about briefly is Gideon versus Wainwright. It involved a man who was sentenced to jail who was not provided legal counsel. He had to represent himself in court. He was not a lawyer, so you can imagine that put him at a disadvantage. Interestingly, Gideon, the man who was uh, sent to jail, actually wrote an appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, he hand-wrote it. It was a handwritten appeal to the Supreme Court. There are pictures on the internet about uh, of his appeal. For somebody who's not a lawyer, that is pretty remarkable. And the fact that the Supreme Court accepted the case from somebody who was not an attorney, who wrote the appeal that was not an attorney was also remarkable. But basically what the Supreme Court said is that anybody accused of a major crime has to be given the right to counsel and that the government has to pay for the counsel if the person cannot afford them themselves. If you go back to the Miranda uh, rights that police read to people when they're arrested, that's part of it. Um, you have the right to counsel if a if you cannot afford one, uh, attorney will be provided to you. That's a paraphrase, but you get the idea. So those are the rights of the accused. We're going to spend more time on the notion of privacy rights because this is one that's a little more difficult to understand. It's a little more complex. We first of all. The word privacy is nowhere written in the Constitution, and the right to privacy is nowhere listed in the Bill of Rights. So why has the Supreme Court ruled that there is a right to privacy? Well, it's because they've interpreted the Bill of Rights as not being a comprehensive list. And indeed, the Founding Fathers did not intend for the Bill of Rights to be a comprehensive list of all the rights that people have. And you can see the evidence of this by reading the Ninth Amendment, which says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Basically, just because a right is not listed in the Bill of Rights doesn't mean that it's not a right that people have. And then the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment, refer to uh, those refer to liberty. And the word liberty refers to a wide variety of actions and activities. So according to the Supreme Court, the Bill of Rights list the most basic and important rights, but there are still other rights that people have that are not listed or enumerated in the Bill of Rights. That leads us to the concept of penumbras. Penumbras are simply taking together a general concept or a general group of rights. So in this case, privacy is considered a penumbra. There are a lot of different amendments that, uh, when taken together, create this right to privacy that's implied heavily by the Supreme Court, by the uh, Bill of Rights, according to the Supreme Court, but is not stated directly. So, and again, this is a controversial topic, this notion of penumbras and privacy rights in the Constitution. Uh, all I'm doing is walking through the Supreme Court logic or argument that's been made via various cases. So how do they come up with this general right to privacy? Well, they cite the Fourth Amendment, which says that the right to be secure in their persons, house, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Taken together, that points to a general right to privacy against government surveillance and government intrusion. The First Amendment itself provides freedom of association and freedom of speech. The idea is that you have the freedom to read and discuss ideas without government coming in and intruding or surveilling you. Government listening in to everything you said would be have a chilling effect. It would make some people less likely to be open about their uh, beliefs. And again, the freedom of speech is vital for democracy because it allows people to criticize the government. And government listening in on everything people say, especially in private, would for some people, keep them from expressing their views openly. And so this right to privacy, it's argued, is a way to protect these other rights, these rights against government um, unreasonably searching and seizing, seizing property or unreasonably surveying and listening in on people's conversations and political communications. So what actions fall under privacy? One of the most private aspects of people's lives is reproduction. And so the Supreme Court has had to grapple with various government regulations related to reproduction. One of the first was Griswold v. Connecticut, which involved a Connecticut ban on contraception. 
Uh, this law prohibited drugstores, supermarkets, and other businesses from selling contraception. And the Supreme Court ruled that that was that the right to use contraception was uh, very private and related to the most private aspect of a person's life, and that government had infringed upon the right to privacy when they banned contraception. The more controversial one is Roe v. Wade, which was uh, involved various statewide bans on abortion. The Supreme Court, in hearing the case, ruled that there is a right to abortion that falls under privacy. It's simply put a right to get le uh, a right to get medical advice from your doctor about pregnancy. So women do have a right to privacy to consult with their doctor about pregnancy, including when to terminate their pregnancy. And the Supreme Court ruled, again, controversial case in Roe v. Wade, that there is a protected, that the Constitution does protect a woman's right to have an abortion in consultation with her doctor. Now, interestingly, Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court created a trimester standard. This is a standard that they used in order to determine whether any law that restricted abortion was a violation of the Constitution or not. And as it suggests, trimester standard, there are three parts to it. It's based on the three different periods in a woman's pregnancy, the three trimesters. During the first trimester, the Supreme Court ruled that government cannot prohibit uh, abortion or access to abortion in any way. So it prohibited regulation of abortion during the first trimester of a woman's pregnancy. During the second trimester, however, government regulation was allowed, even if it uh, involved restrictions on access to abortion, but those regulations had to be focused on protecting the health and the safety of the mother. And during the third trimester, the Supreme Court actually allowed complete bans. What that means is that states or local governments can actually ban abortions completely during the third trimester under Roe v. Wade. This trimester standard was case law for several years, um, actually several decades, until the Supreme Court replaced it during a famous case, Casey versus Planned Parenthood, with the undue burden standard. The trimester standard was replaced with an undue burden standard that said that any restriction that imposes an undue burden on abortion is unconstitutional. Restrictions are still allowed, but all restrictions have to require a health and life of the mother exemption, which means that if a local government or a state wants to ban a certain type of abortion or regulate abortion and that in a way that creates restrictions on women's access to it, that first of all, that law cannot impose an undue burden. We'll talk about what that means in a second. And secondly, that there has to be an exception in the law that a woman can have access to abortion if the pregnancy represents a danger to her health or her life. Now, one of the criticisms of the Casey decision is that it replaced a pretty clear standard, trimesters, with a very unclear standard. Um, what is undue in terms of a burden? Burden is fair, I, I think burden is fairly clear. Anything that involves some type of restriction or burdens a woman in accessing abortion. But the undue part and the ambiguity or the, and the meaning of that term has led to some criticism of the case uh, and the Supreme Court ruling. So it's interesting to note that the Supreme Court in the past has gone from more ambiguous standards to more clear ones, but in this case went the opposite way from what is arguably a very clear standard with the trimesters and the amount of regulation government can have across the different trimesters in a woman's pregnancy to a much less clear one uh, in the terms of anything that imposes an undue burden is not allowed. Now, the Supreme Court did flirt with a viability standard, which simply said that regulation after the point of viability are allowed and regulation before the, po before the point of viability in a woman's pregnancy is not allowed, or yeah, is not allowed. But that was very short-lived because <clears throat> through medical advances, the point of viability has changed over the years. And so the Supreme Court realized that was just not a workable one and they've tended to stick with the undue burden standard. So that's a brief background on the case law regarding reproduction rights, contraception, and abortion. There is, but there is one more topic we're going to talk about that falls under the area of privacy rights and reproduction, which is sodomy. In one of the most unfortunately named Supreme Court cases, 
uh, Bowers v. Hardwick, in 1986, the Supreme Court heard a case involving a Georgia uh, ban, a ban on sodomy in the state of Georgia. And to quote the law, a person convicted of the offense of sodomy shall be punished by imprisonment for not less than one nor more than 20 years. So this allowed up to 20 years in prison for people who engaged in sodomy. Now, if you're not sure of what exactly we mean by sodomy, uh, go ahead and pause the recording and look it up. I'm not going to talk about it here, but uh, the point is that several states uh, back in the 1980s and you know before had laws that actually prohibited sodomy and created prison sentences, sometimes as much as 20 years in prison, for people who engaged in them. Now, the Supreme Court ruled on this case and said that the Constitution does not protect sodomy, and it actually upheld the Georgia law, which stood until sometime around 2000 or 2001. So in 1986, the Supreme Court actually said that sodomy could be banned by government. Sodomy is not a practice as, uh, that is protected by the, Supreme, or by the Bill of Rights and therefore upheld the Georgia ban on it, which raises several questions, which is what about other sexual acts? Could government, for instance, come in and regulate other ways that people have sex? I'm not to get into details about that, but it does raise that question. Is this case inconsistent with Roe v. Wade? Remember, Roe v. Wade ruled that there's a constitutional right to privacy and that uh, access to abortion is part of that privacy. Why is why would the outcome of sex be more private than the way that you have it? So that raised uh, that created some criticism of the Bowers v. Hardwick decision because people felt like it was inconsistent with previous rulings related to privacy. And again, why is visiting a doctor to get consultation about termination of a pregnancy more private than having sex in one's own bedroom? That led in 2003 to the Supreme Court hearing another case, this one involving a Texas sodomy law. And what made the Texas law very different from other sodomy laws at the time was that it targeted uh, the LGBT community specifically. It said that gay sodomy is illegal, but heterosexual sodomy is okay, and the law allowed it. Some scholars think that that distinction, that specific targeting of the LGBT community in terms of sodomy laws, is what required the Supreme Court to overturn it. And in a 6-3 decision, they actually did overturn the law. Um, three justices are, continue to argue that sodomy is not protected under the Constitution, uh, they felt like the, there was not a universal right to privacy. They rejected the idea of penumbras, and so they, um, they voted to allow the Texas law to stand. Six justices voted to overturn it. They argued that sodomy is protected uh, under the right to privacy, and today, now, sodomy laws by states, all of them have been overturned by the Supreme Court, and states are no longer allowed to ban that. There's a lot more regarding civil liberties and the Supreme Court case law. This, I think, hopefully is enough to give you a sense of uh, the topic and how the Supreme Court thinks about issues involving the Bill of Rights and civil liberties. Again, there's, it's a huge area. We teach entire classes on case law regarding civil liberties and constitutional rights. If you're interested, uh, you can take one of those classes or research it more on your own. But we're going to end the discussion of civil liberties here, and the next topic we're going to talk about is civil rights.